today a very timely live at lunch presentation from Luke Niferatos from the Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Timely in that just this morning we woke up to a tweet from our Lieutenant Governor, John Fetterman, who has been a strong advocate for the legalization, widespread legalization of uh, commercial, or of uh, recreational marijuana in Pennsylvania from long before he was our Lieutenant Governor. That was one of the positions that he had strongly advocated for. And uh, so on social media this morning, uh, not wanting to let a crisis go to waste, our Lieutenant Governor uh, posted uh, a uh, post on Twitter and probably in some other places as well, uh, looking to use the budget shortfall projected potentially be as many as uh, several billion dollars as a result of the COVID-19 crisis to use marijuana uh, to plug that hole. And in what I would describe as a mocking tone, uh, he put this, uh, this post up talking about, uh, he started off, I'm truly afraid if Pennsylvania legalizes marijuana, it could help fill a massive budget for shortfall and very likely many zeros of, pe zeros of people will die from overdoses. And then he goes on to say, you know, in a mocking tone again, we're gonna, you know, other issues, risk eliminating a substantial system systematic racially skewed public policy outcome. He's sort of hitting the talking points in a sort of reverse mocking sort of way, the talking points that the advocates of legalized commercialized marijuana want to make in advancing it. But most notably, though, is his push to use the crisis that we're currently in to push this through the legislature in a rapid fashion and something we need to be aware of and concerned about if we understand the issue of what legalization of marijuana will bring to Pennsylvania. That's why this call today is so timely with the expert that we have. And so, Dan, I'll toss it back to you to introduce our special guest. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And I know with Lieutenant Governor, you know, it's the one thing he's pointed to in this midst of the COVID crisis. And, and so it is the concern, certainly, I think, with what Luke is going to be bringing up. I'll, I'll introduce Luke Neferatos. He is the Chief of Staff and Senior Policy Advisor for Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Uh, they are a national nonprofit and really have become the leading advocate, leading policy organization opposed to the next big tobacco, uh, you know, the commercialized marijuana industry. So Luke, he's advised governors across the country. He's advised many elected officials on this issue, uh, dozens of events and town halls, including here in Pennsylvania. And he's been on national media outlets, Fox News, CNBC, a variety of outlets. He's really been a top leader, top voice on this issue. And, and I, I thank Luke for that. So Luke, thank you so much. Welcome to the call. Thank, thank you, Dan. Joining us. I know you're from Colorado. And I welcome the presentation you're going to give. And, and we did have submitted questions. And I thought to point to one of the submitted questions from Dana in Irwin, Pennsylvania, asked, what have been the effects on people in states where recreational marijuana is already legalized? So Luke, I know you're looking to address that in depth. And I appreciate that. So go ahead. Certainly, you can introduce yeah. any, anything else and, and get on with your presentation. So thanks. Yeah. So much. Well yeah, thank you, Dan. I just want to first of all thank the Pennsylvania Family Institute for having me. Um, you all are doing incredible work um, in your state, and it's an honor to be uh, on your live at lunch here today and um, really appreciate all the work that you do. Um, I am from Denver, Colorado, and Dana, I am so glad you asked that question. I wish that more of the lawmakers and leaders, including the Lieutenant Governor in Pennsylvania and other states, I wish they were all asking the same question because um, I think that's really where we need to start when we think about the marijuana issue is what are we learning in the states that have legalized it? Um, that is the best place to look to try to get some data, some facts, and make a more informed decision for Pennsylvania and also for the rest of the country. Um, so I will dive right into that because I've got a presentation chock full of all this. Um, I do wanna say, you know, being from Denver, Colorado, um, raised here, I was in Colorado uh, before, during, and after legalization of marijuana. Um, I am raising a three-year-old daughter with my lovely wife. Um, and I am seeing what that impact is like as a parent. Um, just as a, an individual uh, living here in, in, in a legal state, and I see that impact uh, in a personal way. Um, so when I talk about this today, I'm going to be speaking a lot from personal uh, firsthand experience. Um, you're going to see some pictures, you're going to see some other things that I've just experienced, um, and I hope that you'll find this informative. Um, regardless of if you are pro or con on legalizing marijuana, I hope that you'll find the next hour or so a time where you can think about this issue from a maybe a perspective that you haven't thought about it before. Um, you're going to hear a lot of science, peer-reviewed journals, 
Um, my organization, SAM, and actually I'll just go ahead and just jump right in as I, as I, before I get ahead of myself. A second here. So hopefully everybody can see my slides. Cool. So yeah, so I, I'm the senior policy advisor at my organization, SAM, is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we are really committed to two things. Um, first off, we want to educate the public on the science of today's marijuana. Um, so, you know, we have a leading scientific advisory board of researchers on marijuana from Harvard, Princeton, University of Colorado, um, some of the leading researchers on marijuana today in the world who are putting out research that's being published in um, highly credible journals across the, the country and across the world. So they lead our work. Um, we want to educate the public on the science of the harms. Um, what does the use of this drug do to you? How is it changing? Um, and then secondarily, I mean, we, we are a policy organization, so we want to promote health first policies on marijuana, not profit based policies on marijuana. And that's a key distinction because a lot of people are talking about marijuana because they want to make a lot of money. Um, we are a public health organization. We think that public health should lead this discussion and any decision that's made on this should be through the, the lens of, is this gonna be healthy? Is this going to be backed by our scientists? Um, those kinds of things. So that's really important uh, to, 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 to designate. So we've collaborated with virtually every major national medical association in this country, um, the American Medical Association, Academy of Pediatrics. All of these associations agree with um, our uh, uh, focus on, you know, rejecting this commercialization of marijuana, which I'll get into. Um, we also have 30, uh, more than 30 now, um, state affiliates across the country doing work educating or in state capitals or even at the federal level. Um, and we're very proud to work with them, including, um, you know, allies and partners such as, such as the Pennsylvania Family Alliance. We have two organizations, our C3 on the right-hand side that I talked about, and then we have SAM Action, our 501c4, um, which does uh, more lobbying work. Uh, it'll work in state capitals to write bills. Um, we'll work on uh, ballot campaigns, et cetera, um, and, that, and that organization is kind of a sister organization uh, for us. We are nonpartisan, by the way. Um, we have uh, worked with Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Libertarians, et cetera. Um, we, uh, our our um, co-founder and president, CEO, uh, Dr. Kevin Sabet is a former three-time White House advisor. Um, he worked most, re most recently for the Obama administration, but also for the Bush administration and the Clinton administration. So he's one of the few people, I think, in this country who have been appointed to both a Republican and Democrat White House, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, we also were co-founded by former Congressman Patrick Kennedy of the Kennedy family, um, Congressman from Rhode Island. Uh, and David Frum, a former uh, speechwriter for the Bush administration. So we really enjoy support on both sides of the aisle and, and we see that as being really important um, going forward. So if there's a slide you don't, uh, if there's one slide you walk away for, with from this presentation, I hope it's this one. Um, right now this issue is being discussed in terms of a false dichotomy. Um, it's either you totally legalize marijuana, you know, go full Colorado, as Lieutenant Governor Fetterman says, uh, which being from Colorado, I can tell you nobody in Colorado, even people who are in support of legalization, they don't think you should all go full Colorado because we got a lot of problems, uh, but we'll get to that. Uh, but you either go full Colorado, uh, you know, full Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman's idea, uh, or you throw everybody in prison and there's no in between. Um, we reject that notion. In reality, this is a much more nuanced policy conversation that we think really falls into three different buckets. Um, so the first bucket you have is criminalization. Do we think that we should criminalize users of marijuana? Um, and look, if this is an issue where you look at this and you say, you know, we're throwing too many people in prison. Um, if that's your problem with, with what our current marijuana laws are, we can do things to reduce criminal penalties um, for this drug. You can uh, decriminalize it uh, for low level use, uh, for example. Um, that would be a way to address that. Uh, but you have multiple options when it comes to decriminalizing this drug you don't necessarily have to fully legalize it. Um, so that's one bucket though, is the criminalization discussion. Um, the second bucket is the medicinal side of this. So are there medicinal uses for the marijuana plant? And the answer to that is absolutely there are. Um, the FDA has approved um, you know, pure CBD uh, it, it, as a prescription medication you can get called Epidiolex. The FDA has also approved pure THC as a medication you can get a prescription for called Marinol. And a lot of people don't know that. Um, and that is the scientific process. That is clinical research and trials going on. Um, that is very different from what we see right now in uh, medical marijuana states, which is basically where they've allowed companies to set up shops and sell the same marijuana that recreational stores are selling. Um, so that's a very political process. It goes to a vote. Um, 
we more support the scientific process where uh, a medicine has to go through clinical trials. It has to be regulated. You have to be able to get a prescription for it. Um, none of that exists with quote unquote medical marijuana right now. And you know, we also have to note that there are hundreds of components of the marijuana plant. So we have a lot more research to do. We know a lot about THC. We know a lot about, you know, we're learning more about CBD, which is another component, but we've got a lot more components we need to look at and see if there's medicinal value. But we should do that from a scientific perspective. Um, number three, the, the third and final bucket of this conversation is, you know, do we think it should be available for recreational purposes or non-medical use? Um, and that's a whole other conversation. And obviously our organization is opposed to that. Um, but it's important we break these out because we hear a lot of conflation of these issues. That's why I have this slide. Because you will hear from people, oh, you know, we're throwing everybody in prison, so let's legalize recreational marijuana. But that doesn't make any sense because if, if you want to talk about criminalization, we can address criminalization without commercializing, allowing a huge industry and sales and production of marijuana. Um, in the same way, if you're saying, you know, I think there are medicinal uses for the marijuana plant, well, let's address that question. Let's talk about policy solutions for that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that because I think it's medicinal that then we need to legalize it for recreational use. That's a completely separate issue. Um, so it's important we don't let these things be conflated. We need to keep them uh, separate. I, I think that's really important. So I'm gonna get into some kind of current news of what's happening with marijuana right now. Obviously we have the, the virus crisis and hopefully everyone on this call is safe and healthy from that and then, um, doing the social distancing. Um, you know, you really realize what a blessing we have to have Wi-Fi, internet, Zoom, um, things that we often take for granted that a lot of people in this country and in this world do not have. Um, so just a moment of gratitude for that um, and gratitude that you're all healthy and well enough to be on today. Um, and I appreciate your time. Uh, but looking at the COVID crisis, marijuana actually has, a, along with tobacco, has a, a role to play in this. So the leader, the head of the um, Institute for National Drug Abuse, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the National Institute for Drug Abuse, uh, which is underneath our NIH, National, National Institutes of Health, uh, Nora Volkow, uh, get issued this advisory the other day saying many of the uh, smokers uh, may actually increase their risk for death and illness uh, for this COVID-19 crisis if they're smoking or using uh, tobacco or marijuana. So it's an interesting tie into this crisis. Obviously, it's not good you know, given our lungs um, to smoke anything right now. Um, so it's just interesting how this is kind of coming into this crisis. Another crisis that hopefully no one's forgotten about because it still continues, um, the CDC is still trying to investigate the many causes of this, is the vaping crisis, which really became known as the pot vaping crisis because over 80% of the lung illnesses and deaths uh, resulted from marijuana vapes, according to the CDC. So this obviously was raging just a few months ago until you know, we had this issue with, um, you know, obviously COVID-19 happened, changed everything. But before that, this is what the CDC was dedicating its time to. And we found out recently that one in six of the marijuana vaping illnesses came from the legal marijuana market, which totally defies this notion that we're going to legalize it and it's being regulated carefully and safely, as Lieutenant, Government, uh, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman was saying in his tweets. Um, this totally flies in the face of that idea. Um, in fact, we had unfortunately two deaths confirmed in Oregon to be directly tied to products sold at legal licensed marijuana dispensaries there in Oregon. So very, very sad outcome from this crisis and it continues because a lot of people thought it was vitamin E, but that was actually less than half of the cases. Um, so they're still trying to find some of the other causes uh, for this and, and we'll learn more soon. Um, I thought this was a really poignant article. A guy came from Ohio um, to Colorado, my state, um, went to one of our legal pot shops and thought it was going to be safe because it was regulated, quote unquote. Um, unfortunately, you can see him, uh, he, he was not doing so great. I think he ended up surviving, but um, he had serious lung issues um, from the marijuana vapes that he purchased there. So another huge uh, ticket item here. Uh, about eight months ago, our U.S. Surgeon General issued a historic advisory on marijuana. Said basically, this is not your mother's marijuana. The, mother, the marijuana today is much more potent than it's ever been, much more addictive. Um, he said, our nation is seeing unprecedented levels of pregnant mothers and youth using marijuana. Um, and he's very, very concerned about it. This was the first U.S. Surgeon General's advisory on marijuana in 40 years. Um, so we are really starting to see um, the concern level rise as the use of this drug rises uh, because some states have chosen to expand it uh, and commercialize it, which we'll get, in, get into now. Um, so really the biggest news around marijuana right now, marijuana policy, is that tobacco is completely taking it over. Um, this is just recently here, just in the last, um, you know, about just a little under a year. Um, the fourth largest tobacco company on the planet, Imperial Brands, has now put in over $100 million into the marijuana industry. 
obviously looking to take it over. Bring it closer to home, because that, that was based in England. Um, Altria, which is the new name for Philip Morris and Marlboro, um, biggest tobacco juggernaut in America, has put in $2 billion into the marijuana industry. Um, so they are absolutely consolidating this industry, and it's only been legal in Colorado for six years. Um, so this is happening very, very, very fast. Um, they're going to deploy their exact same business model, which is exactly what Sam is concerned about. Um, we started in 2013 because we thought this would become the next big tobacco. You can probably see over my, my shoulder here, right here, uh, our little moniker. It's, I'm kind of in the way, but it says preventing the next big tobacco. Um, and, and that is what we were concerned about. This has been our, mon our moniker for the last six years, and now it's actually becoming big tobacco before our eyes. Um, and that's been something we've been very worried about. So yeah, they've basically taken it over already. These are some other uh, tobacco companies that have uh, gotten in on the marijuana game. I encourage you to go to our website here, learnaboutsam.org slash industry profiles. You will see all the predatory industries that are taking this over, alcohol, uh, tobacco, uh, pharma, et cetera. And what's interesting is just like tobacco got smoking into restaurants, lounges, and hotels, et cetera, now the marijuana industry is doing the exact same thing. Uh, they are now exempt from the Colorado Clean Indoor Air Act as of a bill passed with a bipartisan majority last year here in my state. Um, so now they can smoke a joint in restaurants, hotels, and lounges uh, that choose to do that. And guess what you can't smoke in any of those places? <laughs> cigarettes. So cigarettes remain banned from being smoked in our, our indoor places, but joints you can smoke. Um, so that's kind of the crazy state of public health that we stand in right now with, with this marijuana issue. If you in uh, Pennsylvania think that the opioid crisis is going really well, um, then maybe you will like marijuana uh, because the CEO who wrote the OxyContin playbook uh, is now running a marijuana company. Um, so these are the same addiction guys, um, drug, uh, basically glorified drug dealers in suits um, who are getting, you know, they already did this with opioids and now they're getting into uh, marijuana as well. Of course, I mentioned alcohol. So we've got all the big alcohol names are, are, are jumping in. Um, Constellation Brands, the biggest alcohol conglomerate, has put in now over a billion dollars into the marijuana industry. Um, and this is the new face of the marijuana movement. I think a lot of us think the people who are leading the charge on marijuana legalization are, you know, dis, you know, disadvantaged communities or maybe those of us who remember the Woodstock days. Obviously, I wasn't around for that, but I, I hear it was hippies, banjos, and other fun things. Uh, but this is the new face. Um, these are guys in suits, and I'm sad to say that this is not a stock photo that I just found on Google. Um, these are the heads of Privateer Holdings, the first ever marijuana hedge fund. Um, these guys have Yale and Harvard MBAs, um, and they already had millions and millions of dollars to begin with. Uh, and they're printing, basically printing money at this point now, making hundreds of millions of dollars off the marijuana industry. Um, and they're based in Wall Street. So those are the winners. Um, those are the leaders of this movement um, that really want to see legalization happen. So obviously Pennsylvania, I know that the opioid epidemic has ravaged a lot of parts of the, parts of the state. I was in a county last year in Pennsylvania that was one of the hardest hit counties in the country uh, when it comes to the opioid epidemic. And of course they're hearing these, these things about, you know, marijuana can cure opioids, um, can cure op our, our, our opioid crisis. And I really wish we had an easy button to do that because if we did, I think, you know, we'd be having different conversations right now. But unfortunately, you look at the science and the research and the data, and that just doesn't bear out. Um, research tells us that if you're a marijuana user, regular marijuana user, you're 2.7 times more likely to abuse, uh, abuse prescription opioids. Okay, so that's not saying that you're going to smoke a joint, take a needle out, and start injecting heroin or anything like that. Um, it's not necessarily a gateway drug uh, by, by that sense. But what that does tell us is there is a link between drugs that we cannot deny. Most people don't just use one drug. It's not like somebody at the age of 16 picks up a needle and starts injecting heroin. They always start with something else. And about 90% of cases, they start with marijuana. Um, so we can't design, deny there's a pathway to these drugs. Um, and that's really important uh, to be borne out in the research uh, as well. Um, you've probably seen billboards like this before. Um, we have them all over Colorado still and, and a lot of other states um, from weed maps, uh, which by the way is like the Yelp for the pot industry. So hardly an academic authority, uh, but they are posting academic journals here and, and we should talk about it. So they have, you know, re it sounds really good. States that legalize marijuana reduced opioid related deaths by 25% and they quote a JAMA article. So it seems, you know, rock solid. This was in 2014. So literally just months after uh, Colorado had legalized marijuana. So I don't know how they had the time to make that designation, uh, but it was very early on. They had the study and they put it out there. Okay, uh, wait five years, 2019, same research article, JAMA, just deployed the same research again, updated it with five more years of data. 
And what did we find? It actually was associated with an increase of 23% in opioid related deaths. Um, so this isn't to say legalize marijuana and more people are gonna die from opioids. But what this is to say is we are way too early on to be saying, oh, you know, it definitely cures the crisis or it definitely doesn't cure the crisis. Um, the, every research study that we have that comes out is telling us different things. Um, so we have a long way to go with the scientific process and we should not rush it uh, by rushing into a big decision like legalizing before we really get the facts. Um, this is just a really great case study on that. I have another uh, tw uh, research article in JAMA 2018 that says the opioid crisis appears to be worsening where it's been legalized. So, you know, some more uh, food for thought there. I will say, you know, right after Colorado legalized marijuana, um, our opioid overdose fatalities have gone up every single year. Um, again, I'm not saying it's causal. I'm not saying we legalized marijuana and it made it worse. Uh, but I am saying that I can say for a fact that it did not reduce our deaths uh, from opioid overdoses. And, and I think that's a key point to make. Um, some other interesting research I'm going to um, go past here. But what are the effects on uh, public health? Uh, what are the effects on the human brain? Um, and when we use marijuana, you use THC, it um, is received by what are called endo endocannabinoid receptors um, throughout the brain. And these receptors are responsible for a host of very important uh, activities, your appetite, your immune system, reproduction. Um, so if use of marijuana is, is truly damaging and becomes more damaging um, to these parts of the brain, that we have serious things to think about um, that will have serious consequences. What I can tell you is we are seeing pretty much a rock solid uh, causal link now. And it's crazy because in science, nobody wants to say causal. You know, they wanna say it's associated with, it's, you know, it may influence, uh, but we're now starting to hear the word causal in these scientific studies now between marijuana use and forms of mental health uh, issues. So we know schizophrenia is becoming a causal link right now, especially if you're starting early. If you're starting, you know, by the age of 15, you can see here in these purple bars, you're 4.5 4. times more likely to develop schizophrenia um, if you're a regular marijuana user um, at that early age. Um, even among adults, we're seeing uh, increases in this as well. And not just schizophrenia, but psychosis and other forms of mental health. Um, so this is probably the, I would say this is probably the biggest uh, research study that's come out on marijuana in the last five years. Um, Lancet Journal of Psychiatry, most uh, credible, probably the most credible, uh, one of the most credible journals in the world, uh, based in Canada, did a population level study on the city of uh, London, a couple other major metropolitan areas. And what they looked at was they followed over a thousand regular marijuana users and to see what their health outcomes were. What they found was uh, regular users of today's high potency marijuana, which I'm gonna get into, but the potency of marijuana is you know, dramatically increased since legalization. Um, regular users of today's marijuana are five times more likely to develop psychosis. It is an astonishing finding um, that was found in this, this, uh, this uh, research and it's been cited widely and I, I encourage you to check it out. Interestingly to note, the cost side of this, they determined that if you pulled these products off the market completely, um, you would reduce their treatment costs by 30% across the entire city of London, um, which is significant. So that's where kind of the cost side of these policy decisions really comes into play. Um, I often hear about, you know, marijuana is safer than alcohol. Let's treat it like alcohol. Um, you know, I think you hear this all over the place, uh, but not quite. First of all, those are totally two different drugs um, with two different impacts on, on our brain and on our, our, our health. Uh, but, you know, there's some longitudinal research that's been done comparing these two user groups, users of alcohol, uh, users of marijuana. And it's really interesting. The red bars here are the marijuana users. Um, and let's just note some of these categories here. Tried to limit use but failed. Marijuana much more caused problems with emotions, nerves, or mental health, tried to cut down but failed, indicating uh, addiction. Um, very serious uh, differences here, and obviously it's not the full story, but in some ways you could argue that marijuana use has maybe greater or different uh, problems than alcohol. So Colorado has been the top state in the country for the last few years when it comes to first-time youth marijuana use. Um, this industry, just like big tobacco and candy cigarettes and the Marlboro Man, um, is targeting our youth. I'm going to show you some things about that in a second. Uh, but we're seeing this increase across the board. Whether you're looking at past month use among 12 to 17 year olds, it's higher. It's overall higher on average for the legalized states, but it's increasing. Um, look at past year use among 12 to 17 year olds. It's increasing and it's much higher than the national average and non-legal states. But I really want you to look at this in the middle of this slide here we are seeing a dramatic increase in cannabis use disorder. Um, and cannabis use disorder uh, is the medical term for marijuana addiction. It's a, you know, it's a coded 
form that your doctor uses. It is absolutely rock solid science that you can be addicted to marijuana. And uh, I'll just tell you these numbers, one in five for youth now, uh, it was one in 10, 10 years ago. Um, so we've seen a dramatic increase in the level of addiction, uh, particularly among youth, uh, but also in adults when it comes to this drug. And I've got some ideas as to why that is, and, and I'll get into that in a second. But what's really interesting is you, know, you talk about targeting youth. Um, somebody sent this to me from Oregon the other day. Um, in Oregon and California, pre-K and kindergartens are not included in their school's definition for legislation that says marijuana shops can't be close to schools. So this is where a dispensary wants to set up shop, right next to this person's private kindergarten that they send their kids to. Um, and they were besides themselves and we tried to help them, but written in the law is they're allowed to do that. But I have a question, why would this industry want to put their dispensary by a private kindergarten? And that's something I'm gonna let everyone think about. Tell you, this is a picture just taken three days ago. Uh, you can look at my Twitter account for some other pictures I took along with this one, right outside of a pot shop uh, here in Denver, Colorado. Okay, so we've got a toddler here and you know maybe a baby in the stroller, uh, but there, obviously there are a lot of issues with this because why are they hanging out with other people here in a line at a pot shop when we were supposed to be social distancing? But this is what this industry is doing. And if we think this won't impact our kids, we've got another thing coming. Um, so today's marijuana, I talked about how it's changed. This is no longer the marijuana we're talking about. Joints, that is so, you know, 30 years ago. Now what we're talking about are these products. And these are not products I just Googled and tried to find scary looking things. They're actually being sold today um, at our pot shops in Colorado and in other legal states, um, Kush Colas. Uh, you know, how many of us think that this is only for 21 and up, right? I mean, obviously this is appealing to younger kids. In fact, uh, when I was putting this presentation together yesterday, uh, my three-year-old was watching over my shoulder and she looked at these little gummies on the top left and she said, oh, that looks yummy. And that really uh, just kind of hit home for me as to why I do what I do. Uh, but, but these things are absolutely appealing uh, for our youth. You know, we have some crazy contraptions they've come up with. This one is a personal favorite, Relax Bro. It's just a blowtorch, um, you know, just dab some, some high potency marijuana. Of course, we have gummy bears. Um, let me tell you a little anecdote about gummy bears for a second, okay? Uh, about two years ago, Washington State thought, you know, and they have legal marijuana there, they thought, hey, it'd be a really great idea to ban marijuana-laced gummy bears. Because regardless of if you're pro or con on marijuana legalization, we can all agree that gummy bears laced with THC is probably pretty extreme. Um, so they wanted to ban it. And they wrote the rule and, um, you know, it, it passed and it was going to the Senate. It looked like it was going to pass. And about a week before the deadline, they totally struck that rule um, from the law that they were passing uh, because of a massive industry lobbying campaign that was done. So you can still buy marijuana laced gummy bears um, in, in Washington state and, no, and a number of other states as well. So it goes to show you the power of the lobby um, and why this industry is learning from big tobacco and starting to take its, its pages from the big tobacco playbook. So we are seeing the potency go up. I mean, what was once two to 3% potency only about 20 or 30 years ago, now up to 99% potency. Um, International Journal of Drug Policy did research on the market a couple of years ago, and they found that 97% THC levels, okay, again, that's compared to two to 3% potency on average, just 20 or 30 years ago. Um, these 97% THC levels make up now more than 15% of the legal marijuana market, and 10 to 15% potency, so that's still a lot more than what it was in the past, is only 2% of the market now. Um, so I, you know, I started two companies, I sold one of them. I, I look at this from a business perspective. This tells me that the market is where the high potency products are. That's where the money is being made. And these are for-profit companies, they're gonna go where the money is. Um, so they're gonna drive up the potency. And this potency is what make, is making this much more addictive. Um, so these are the kinds of products you see to get to that high potency level. Um, you know, this looks like a narcotics bust. This doesn't really look like, uh, you know, a homegrown plant made by hippies in their backyard or people, you know, doing a co-op organic farm. That's not what this is about anymore. This is commercial grade. Um, these are laboratories extracting THC from the marijuana plant, adulterating it, um, making these kinds of concentrates. Um, it's a totally different drug now. It's anything but organic and natural. Um, so it's all about industry. In summary, you know, they're going after the kids, um, potencies, uh, you know, through the roof contaminants. You know, we all think, a lot of, I hear this from a lot of people, you know, I don't want, you know, I don't want people using marijuana, they'll tell me, uh, but you know what, at, let's legalize it. So at least if my kids are going to do it, um, at least they're not going to go to a drug dealer. They're going to go to a regulated safe place to get safe weed. Um, and that has just not been the case. Putting aside for a second, the obvious, you know, grill in the room of the massive vaping crisis where people have now died from marijuana vaping products that have been adulterated in legal places. Uh, but setting that aside for a second, 
we've had hundreds of thousands of products recalled in Colorado and other states that have legalized it. Um, these products are anything but safe. And the black market and drug dealers have continued to grow. And, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and finally, we see a huge lobby that now that is fighting against regulation. The marijuana lobby is now the third biggest lobbying presence in the state of Colorado. Um, the only people that are beating it are oil and gas. Um, and I forget the other industry, but it's another major one. Um, so they have a huge lobbying presence and it's very hard to get them to uh, submit to the kind of regulations that I think we all would like to see um, if it was gonna be legal. Can't highlight this enough. Altria put in $2 billion. This is big tobacco over again. And I wanna tell you, they put this $2 billion investment in. Um, the, the news broke in December of 2018, but it was official in uh, January, the first week of January, okay? And that was uh, January, 2019. So first week of January, 2019, Philip Morris Marlboro puts in $2 billion in the marijuana industry. Second week of 2019, uh, they put in a $14 billion investment for a 35% stake in a little company called Juul. I think we've all heard of Juul and maybe seen them getting grilled in Congress uh, before this whole crisis happened. Um, Juul largely took the fall for this, um, this massive crisis and rightfully so, they targeted kids. They own about 80% of the vaping market. But it's really interesting to me. So first week of January, they invest in pot. Second week of January, they invest in vaping. And, and this company is basically owns the vaping market. And that was in 2019. Six months, eight months later, we have a marijuana vaping crisis. Okay, so I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I think Altria saw the writing on the wall of where this market was going and what people were gonna be doing with these vape pens. Um, they were gonna be using marijuana with it. It's just very interesting how you see the background of what the corporate takeovers um, are leading to just only six to eight months later. Um, for those of you who don't know, Juul started off as a marijuana vaping company called Pax. Um, Juul was spun off of Pax, but Pax continues to sell marijuana vapes. Um, and these marijuana vapes are used to vaporize the 99% potency marijuana oils. And look at the design of these. It's so beautiful. It's aesthetically pleasing to the eye, um, just kind of like an Apple product maybe. Maybe it looks similar to you to a MacBook Pro or an iPhone. Um, and if you see that similarity, you're not wrong because the same Stanford Design School guys that designed Apple's products designed these products as well. So that should tell you about A, the money that's gone into this, and B, the fact that these companies are designing these products to be used all the time. They want people to be addicted because if they're addicted, they're gonna drive more money, they're gonna buy more products. And that's the way the for-profit model works. And of course, they use social media influencers, Instagram, uh, you know, celebrities, et cetera, to push their products, their, their vapes and, and other things. Um, so, you know, look, this addiction model is based in just solid fact, let's be honest. Um, let's look at the alcohol industry. Many of you may, may not know this, 10% of our population of America make up 75% of the alcohol industry's sales. Okay, so the average user in that cohort, that big red bar you see, drinks 10 drinks of alcohol a day. So basically the alcohol industry is making all their money off of horrible, horribly raging alcoholics who are really in need of help. Um, and so they're taking advantage of those users. Uh, and that's the way that they're making their money. Um, they don't care so much about the people who drink a glass of wine a week or, you know, what, you know, occasional drinkers. They want the heavy drinkers and they want to keep them addicted because that's where their revenues come from. So, you know, why do I bring this up? Well, let's compare this model. This is obviously I'd, I'd call this addiction for profit. Let's call this addiction for profit model and see how it's working in for marijuana. This is from the Colorado Department of Revenue. 22% of the users of marijuana in this state are making up about 70% of the consumption. Okay, so they're making their money off the heavy users too. They do not care about the people who are just gonna try it you know, once or twice and then be done with it. That's not what they care about. They want people who are gonna use it again and again and again and again. Because again, this is a for-profit industry. This, these are not nonprofits. These are not you know, clinics trying to dispense medicine. Um, these are for-profit companies whose responsibility is to their shareholders, which means that they have to sell products to get a return on investment for their shareholders. And the only way to do that is unfortunately, when it comes to drugs and capitalism, is addiction. Um, and we have to be concerned about that. So uh, look, let's see how it's going in Colorado. This is where I'm from, where I'm living it every day. Um, last year, I was walking with my uh, then two-year-old daughter and, and my wife, downtown Denver, went into a backpack store. Um, right at the entrance to the backpack store, I found this, so I snapped a picture after the fact. Uh, but right, after, you know, right at the entrance were these, this little tray of chocolates. My daughter and I both love chocolate. And I thought, let's grab her some. So I grabbed her a cup and I took a cup for myself and we were about to eat it. And I thought, you know, something looks funny about the packaging on these things. Um, and I looked closely and I found that these uh, products had 
10 milligrams of THC in each square, um, which anyone who uses marijuana will tell you uh, that that'll get you very high. Um, but no warning on this. Um, there's, you can see there's like a tiny little red uh, kind of yield sign that says THC on it. Thank God I know what THC means. Most people do not know what THC means. Um, uh, and, and so this is kind of the state of things. It's the Wild West. Um, you have stores like a backpack store that's got these up there. No one's guarding it. I had no idea what this was. Um, and so, you know, you as a parent and also just as an individual, you think there's got to be a better way to do this um, than that. And of course, we have pot shops everywhere tons and tons of pot shops. The one on the top left is actually um, diagonally across the street from my wife's old high school that she graduated from. Um, so the kids are definitely seeing these stores everywhere. It's becoming very normalized. Um, and what are these pot shops doing? 70% of them, according to Denver Health, uh, have uh, recommended pot products, high potency THC products to pregnant mothers. 70% of them. Um, really concerning state of affairs. And of course, the Journal of Pediatrics says that THC remains in your breast milk up to six days, can lead to low birth weights, even the death of one child has been attributed to use of marijuana during pregnancy. Um, the American Academy, the, uh, Academy of Pediatrics released an advisory saying to completely avoid um, using marijuana. And of course, we had the Surgeon General more recently say this is a complete disaster. Um, pregnant mothers should not be using this. So big concern. Um, we did some things to try to bring attention to that, bring accountability to this industry. Um, we put uh, bibs on every pot shop in Denver saying, please don't hurt our future, sign Colorado kids. Um, unfortunately, you know, we got a lot of great press coverage on this, but unfortunately, um, nothing happened with the industry. They got to continue business as usual. There were no penalties, no fines. Um, it was really uh, quite unfortunate. So every two years, the Colorado Health Department, uh, our Department of Health and Environment, has to release a public health report on how legalization of marijuana is going. Um, I encourage you to check that out. Um, here's some key findings from that report. Um, we're seeing a huge increase in the poisonings of children, marijuana poisonings of children under the age of nine. Um, we see over 23,000 homes where, uh, with children where they're not storing marijuana products safely. And you know that number sounds bad, but let me just put that into perspective for you, just to give you a real life example. Um, you know, I've got a, a child, she's not old enough to go play at her friend's house yet, but I have a lot of friends who are parents and they have kids that are old enough to go and, and play with uh, their, at their friend's house. And one of my friends was telling me the other day, he said, you know, um, whenever my kid goes to play at his friend's house, I have to ask those parents, do you have marijuana uh, products in your home? Are they stored safely? Keeping these things away from the, the reach of our kids. Um, so these are the questions now that parents um, in our state have to ask. Uh, that they never have you know, had to ask before uh, legalization. And so it's things like that you just don't think about. Um, and of course, secondhand marijuana smoke, major issue. Um, just for the record, the American Lung Association says secondhand marijuana smoke has exactly the same effect in carcinogens um, as secondhand tobacco smoke. So there's no difference. Um, and so that impact on kids is one that we will feel. Um, these are two reporters who are friends of mine um, in Denver. Um, interesting anecdotes that they provide. Um, I won't dwell a lot on it, but I will say we have a lot of Girl Scouts selling cookies outside of pot shops, um, which by the way is a great business idea, probably a great business decision. Uh, but on the other side of things as a parent, I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's what you want your kids doing, uh, but that's what we're seeing. It's just pure uh, normalization. So we have over a thousand pot shops in Colorado compared to about 600 Starbucks and McDonald's combined. Um, so think about all the Starbucks and McDonald's that you see and double that number. Um, and that is a lot of pot shops that we have out there. Again, industry is clearly pushing for complete normalization. So we thought, look, let's try to work uh, within the framework of these legal states. Let's try to advocate for better regulations, which I'm sure many people watching this think, you know, why don't you push for, for more proactive stuff? So let's talk about that. We pushed to cap THC potency. We thought, you know, allowing unlimited marijuana potency everywhere in the country, probably a bad idea. I think we could all reasonably agree that we should have some sort of cap. Um, so we pushed for a cap now three times and the marijuana industry has shut it down every single time. We even tried to do signature gathering to get it on the ballot in Colorado. And when the industry got word of that, they uh, used their you know, war chest of money and they hired every single signature gathering company in the state of Colorado. So we were powerless to, to do anything. So that's just the state of affairs. They know they're making money on that. They don't want to cap potency, even though we know so little about it. Um, and of course, limit on number and location of stores. They're definitely not interested in that. Um, and the money has often been diverted in places taxpayers don't want it to go. And I will jump into that in just a little bit. So impact on our youth is you know, getting a lot clearer, I think. Um, this study from Monitoring the Future, which is probably the second foremost study on drug use and behavior among youth in this country, um, done out of uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, 
Um, one in four 12th graders said they would try marijuana or increase their use of marijuana if it was federally legalized. Um, so that's 25%. We know that the decision from a policy perspective will have an impact on future generations. So looking at poison control center calls, of course, those have gone up significantly. That's doubled in Colorado since legalization. This is just the most recent data in 2019. 270% um, increase in Oregon uh, for five-year-olds calling in and younger uh, to the poison control centers. 70% um, increase in Washington state. So we're seeing huge increases of uh, particularly youth, but also adults needing to go to the hospital. Um, and we've seen about a 200% increase in Colorado's hospitalization rates for marijuana related issues. Um, I want to talk about that for a second because I actually used to work in healthcare. I, I worked for the largest um, hospital in Colorado, Centura Health, and it was my job to get this graph to go the other way, to be honest with you. Um, we wanted less people to be going to the hospital because you know, I think everybody on this uh, Zoom call who's ever been to the hospital or been to the emergency room knows that you get a massive bill uh, afterward. It's extremely expensive, if, uh, particularly for people without insurance, but even with insurance. Um, so it's a huge cost issue for people. Um, so to have this kind of a number, this shows you that it, you know, this isn't something that just impacts the person who used marijuana. Um, the person who used marijuana, yes, they're in a, in a tough situation, they're having to go to the hospital, but if they're, on, uh, if they're uninsured or if they're on taxpayer subsidized insurance like Medicare and Medicaid, this is a cost point that is impacting all of us. Um, and that's really important to note that this is something that impacts the community. It does not just impact the individual. Um, and getting more at that, uh, you know, Lieutenant Governor uh, Fetterman made the comment that, you know, he thinks more zero people will die from marijuana. Um, but I've got a lot of moms of children who have died from marijuana impaired drivers who would probably be inclined to disagree. Um, look at these facts. 151% increase in marijuana impaired driving deaths in Colorado as of last year huge increase in the number of people who are dying on the roads um, there. Washington State, AAA just re released a very highly cited study um, uh, last month uh, that found that more than doubled uh, the number of people dying from marijuana impaired drivers in Washington State. So that's another huge finding. Um, and finally, look at Oregon. 50% of all of their drivers that they've assessed have tested positive for marijuana impairment, um, you know, after legalization. So that is a huge issue. Um, obviously, you know, look, we don't have a roadside test. That's a big issue. Uh, we don't have a way to effectively test immediately on the side of the road if someone's impaired or not. We know that THC remains in your bloodstream for up to 30 days. So, you know, look, we don't know for a fact that every single one of the people driving these things was absolutely impaired. Uh, but the, in the increase in the presence of THC and what we know about how THC impacts the brain um, tells us enough to know that there is a huge issue here and that these numbers are, are increasing for a reason. So we've seen more of this in Nevada. Um, Washington traffic study, I'm going to skip over, but I will point out one stat here. 64% of respondents who openly admitted to using marijuana within two hours of driving, so we know for a fact that they were impaired, um, stated that they did not think it impaired their ability to drive at all. Okay, so huge education problem here. And we have an, is an issue where the industry is putting out so much irresponsible rhetoric, so much irresponsible marketing, saying we've even seen stuff to say they're saying marijuana will cure COVID. Um, let alone marijuana is going to cure cancer and make you drive better, make you smarter. We hear all these kinds of things, help you sleep, et cetera, um, completely without science backing it. And this is the result is people just have no idea what this drug can really do. Um, so workplace, and I, and I think we probably had some questions on the workplace impact. I think it's really important to call out because it's very concerning what we're seeing now. Quest Diagnostics, they do the uh, drug tests for pretty much everybody, hundreds of millions of that a, a year. Um, they just did a release uh, late last year found that double digit increases in marijuana positivity in the workplace in every state that has legalized marijuana. Every single one of them. The lowest increase is Massachusetts, which was 21%. So these numbers look scary, but let me just bring it home for you here. If you work in a factory uh, or you are getting on an airplane or getting on a train um, and your coworker uh, comes in high, that is a serious risk to you and your job or you in public transit. Um, so these are things we have to think about um, and getting kind of into that note, look, it was a huge increase nationally, but double the increase in the safety sensitive workforce. And that got me thinking, what do they mean by safety sensitive workforce? So I, I dug into their press release here, in, uh, Quest's, uh, Quest Diagnostics press release. They define safety sensitive workforce as pilots, rail, bus and truck drivers, workers in nuclear power plants. None of these people are the people you want using marijuana. Um, at any time, but certainly not during the job or, or you know, shortly before then. So these are things we have to think about now. Um, the developments are really kind of moving in the wrong direction right now. I will say that because of this great industry, um, th this great industry's uh, great lobbying efforts. Um, Nevada just became the first state they have legal marijuana there. 
first state to ban job applicants from, uh, re you know, ban rejecting job applicants for marijuana use. In other words, they test positive during job application, you have to accept them. No exceptions. So truck drivers, et cetera, um, they can all get in. Um, that is a concerning development we want to continue to watch. We've also seen some Supreme Court decisions that have split both ways on this issue, um, and we're going to need to continue monitoring it. We do know that a lot of the research, this is some older research, um, but still highly cited, shows that regular marijuana users are obviously more prone to accidents and other things um, that impact the bottom line for employers. I will tell you our largest construction company in Colorado, GE Johnson, their CEO said they can't find anybody to pass a drug test. So they're hiring people from out of state to take construction jobs. That's not the direction you wanna see for your state. So, you know, I hear two things a lot when it comes to this issue. I hear that it's a state's rights issue and we should just let the states do whatever they want, regardless of federal law. Um, and I also hear that using, uh, that legalizing marijuana will get rid of the black market. We'll get rid of the drug dealers, we'll get rid of the cartels. Um, both of these things sound intuitive, uh, but they have proven to be completely false uh, by the data that we've seen. So let's just get started here. Cal uh, California's governor, Gavin Newsom, just last year said, the black market has gotten worse, not better, since the legalization of marijuana in California. They are, um, they've actually called in the National Guard to help them fight the cartels and all of the illegal pot grows in their state. It's a complete disaster in California and their governor has completely admitted to that. So huge issues there. Um, and it's not just there. Colorado, uh, my state, has delivered black market weed to 32 different states. And if you look at this map, a whole bunch of these states did not vote to legalize marijuana. So they're having to deal with the impact of a decision that my state made. Um, so, you know, that kind of takes, again, this whole notion that, oh, you know, whatever one state does or whatever one person does, really that's their own business. Um, when you start allowing commercialization, this industry does not want to stay in my state. Um, this industry does not want to stay in the, you know, the six or seven other states that have legalized marijuana. They want the whole country and the whole world to legalize. So, of course, they're shipping their products elsewhere and trying to get it um, seen by others. And, of course, the, the, the cartels are going to jump in on the action, too, because they can use the cover of legalization. Um, and here's a great article on why that is. Um, foreign cartels have totally taken over the business here in Colorado. We have three new foreign cartels, one from China, um, one from Mexico, uh, that have set up shop in our national forests and actually in suburban communities. So you see this picture here. This is in a home, and I believe it was uh, Lakewood, which is right um, you know, a nearby suburb of Denver. And the cartels are taking homes in these suburban communities, very nice community. My aunt and uncle uh, have a, a grow house that was found next door to them. Uh, and they live in a very wonderful uh, little suburban community in Aurora. Um, and they take these homes, the cartels do, they buy these homes, they gut them, they put about two to 300 pot plants in them and turn them into grow houses. Um, and they've got hundreds of homes that they're doing that with. And everyone, who could, ask anybody in Colorado, they'll tell you they've either seen it or they've heard about it because everyone here in the state knows about it. Um, and the way they can track these homes is they just look at the, ele the electricity usage, you know, across a grid and they see one home is using, you know, thousands of kilowatts of electricity versus all the other homes. Um, so it's a huge issue. We're seeing black market weed is better than ever, uh, bigger and stronger than ever. Um, and that's just continuing to increase. So I'm just going to bring this home with, I think, the best uh, example of why legalization does not remove the black market um, here in, uh, there in Oregon just 18 to 30 percent of Oregon's marijuana market, and they've legalized it, uh, is legal. So in other words, 70 percent of Oregon's marijuana market is totally illegal black market. This is according to their Oregon State Police report. Okay, so it's a disaster there. They have not gotten rid of the black market at all. And the Oregon Secretary of State issued a scathing audit of them in 2019, saying only three percent of the pot shops have been inspected. So God knows what these pot shops are selling. I, they could be selling anything for all we know because no one has inspected them. And I thought this quote was particularly poignant. Oregon's marijuana testing program cannot ensure that test results are reliable and products are safe. Okay, so this, the notion that we're going to legalize and regulate, it's going to be safe, inspected marijuana completely out the window in Oregon. And so this came out in early 2019, okay? We went to them, we got a meeting with the governor's top staff, and we said, you need to pull these products off the market right now until you can assure that they are safe. And they said, no, 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 like we've got it, no problem, we're not gonna do that. Six to eight months later, the vaping crisis hits us. And does anyone who's watching this remember what state I told you had two confirmed deaths from their legal marijuana dispensaries? Oregon. So what basically happened here was the governor and the governor's staff put the interests of a very well-financed industry 
selling these drugs over the interests of the health and well-being of the people of Oregon. And two people lost their lives because it was too politically tricky to pull products off the market when they were warned in advance that these products were not safe. That tells you why this becoming the next big tobacco is such a concern and why our organization is fighting to stop this from going too much further because that is more of what we're gonna see. And we've already seen it with one national crisis. So you look at our public schools, you know, by far, uh, marijuana is the number one offense in our public schools in Colorado. And you know, we often hear that we should legalize marijuana as a social justice issue. Um, that if we legalize this drug and allow commercial industry, that we'll get rid of arrests and um, disproportionately impacted communities. I wish that were true. Uh, but what we've seen is the opposite has happened. If you're African American, you're twice as likely to be arrested for a marijuana offense now, um, after legalization, than you were before. Um, it's a huge issue, uh, especially you know, compared to white arrests. So uh, the arrest disparities continue. Um, and you know, we see some other data on that as well. But I actually think legalization of marijuana leads to um, social injustice. And this uh, little setup here, I think will explain why. So the bottom right hand part of this screen here is the city of Denver. Green uh, areas are Caucasian white communities. The other colors are the minority communities. So you know, the yellow and the purple here. Um, now I want you to look at the top left map. All those dots, every single one of them is a pot shop. Okay, I think, think we can all see what's happening here. This is like a heat map. The marijuana industry, uh, you know, let, let me just put it this way. We all know where the payday loan stores are. We know where the liquor stores are, and we certainly know where the tobacco stores are. And what I'm telling you is that the marijuana stores are going right next door to those. Um, they are targeting the minority communities, the most, uh, the most vulnerable communities that they can find. They're putting the pot shops there and they're making money off of them. And some of you may say, oh, it's great that they're putting the, the pot shops there because you know, the minority communities are getting uh, ownership and making money off of this. Well, unfortunately you're wrong. Um, less than 2% of the marijuana industry has any form of minority ownership at all. And I'm not just talking about you know, black or white. I'm talking about women. I'm talking about any kind of demographic, demographic measurement you wanna use none of those people have any ownership in this industry. So the people who are making money on this, unfortunately, are guys who look like every one of us that you can see on the screen right now. The white guys in suits, okay? We're all uh, you know, at home now, but those are the ones who are making the money. People in Wall Street, Silicon Valley, um, you know, those are the people who are making money on this. It's not the mom and pop shops, and it's certainly not the disadvantaged communities, and it's, it's a real travesty. So another thing we hear, and I know this is being pitched hard in, in Pennsylvania. I had a Really fun time debating uh, Senator Dalen Leach uh, on this subject on a TV down hall uh, last year. Um, but is, you know, we're gonna make a whole bunch of money off of marijuana taxes. Now, let me just, just put it to you plain and simple. I bumped into our former governor, John Hickenlooper, again um, a few months ago in Chicago um, at the airport. And I told him I've been using this quote from him. And he said, yeah, please keep using it because it's 100% true. Uh, and this is the quote he, he gave. Um, he said, do not legalize marijuana for the revenue is a drop in the bucket. Okay, that is a direct quote from uh, John Hickenlooper, who's now running for U.S. Senate here in Colorado. Um, if you don't believe him, um, maybe you'll believe former California Governor Brown, um, who said that we never expect to receive money uh, or very much money from marijuana revenues uh, in this state in California. So you go to the people in these administrations in these states, and they may even be pro-legalization. Like John Hickenlooper is, is pro-legalization, you know, for the most part, uh, but he even will tell you, you're not gonna make money off of this. So how has it worked out? How have the numbers crunched uh, in Colorado? It, it really has not worked out well. Um, the most money being made right now as a percent of the state budget is in Colorado, 0.78%. I mean, we're talking about nothing here, pennies on the dollar. Um, and we know that this makes sense because you look at tobacco and alcohol taxes, we're losing money on those, uh, on those revenue programs compared to social, uh, uh, social costs. So again, this is not gonna be a windfall of revenue. You're certainly not gonna get a golden textbook in every desk. Um, you know, Denver Post uh, you know, obviously said this isn't gonna solve our budget problems. So look, we have to look at the costs. I started a company, if I told my board we're making $10 million a year, they'd laugh me out of the room because they'd want me to, they'd say, well, you know, what was your cost of doing business? You know, if it costs you $20 million to make $10 million, then you're running a lousy business. You're losing $10 million. So we have to look at the costs. And we've done cost reports in a number of states. And of course, look, like we have a bias. We obviously are an organization with an agenda, but nobody else is doing the cost studies. We can't get the governments to release the costs. We can't get anybody to release the costs. So until somebody does, we're going to continue to fill the gap. And if you look at the costs, you put it, tally it all up together, property damage, absenteeism, et cetera, 
the costs vastly outweigh even the rosiest rest, uh, revenue estimates. So it's really important that we look at both sides of the equation here. So I'm gonna kind of stream through this. Elections 2018, North Dakota totally defeated legalization there. Um, Michigan uh, approved it. We worked very closely with the NAACP there, which was a really cool partnership. Again, pushing back against this notion that legalizing marijuana is gonna to lead to social justice. And really what that leaves us with is, you know, two, splits, two states split on it at the ballot in 2018. The jury is still out on this. Um, look, everybody's seen the polls that says, you know, 60, 70% of people support legalizing marijuana. And you, you may say, Luke, you know, you presented a really nice case today, but everybody wants it, so get over it. Let's just make the best of it. Um, but not so fast, not so fast. How many of you remember uh, the poll I had at the, or the, the slide I had at the beginning that, you know, was talking about how this is three different issues? Um, there is a nuance to this policy question that is not being represented in the polls. These polls are yes or no. Do you want to legalize it? Yes or no. Um, and I'm going to give you a great case study of what we did here to push back on that. Emerson College did a poll in New York and they said, do you want to legalize it? Yes or no? And 60% said yes. Okay. Um, we went to Emerson College and we said, look, uh, we think it'd be really cool if you went back to the same poll respondents that answered this poll and asked them the same question, uh, but gave them four options instead of yes or no. And they said, sure, why not? So the four, question, the four uh, options we gave them were keep the current policy, which was decriminalization in New York, uh, meaning low level offenses you know, were decriminalized, um, you know, have medical marijuana, have recreational marijuana, or you know, completely prohibit it. And when we gave them those four options, support fell for, from 60% to 40% uh, for legalizing recreational marijuana. So that shows you that there's a lot more nuance to this that people have than is being covered and that it is being captured by these polls. People do not want pot shops in their community. They don't want gummy bears. Um, maybe they think they don't want their next door neighbor to go to jail for having a joint in his pocket, uh, but they don't want this full commercialized industry. And it's really important we, we call that out because we did a poll again in 2019, national poll with Emerson, found 68% of Americans wanted any of the three other options other than recreational marijuana legalization. That is a stunning statistic that we are just not seeing in the national media right now. Um, so it's very, you know, we really have to realize there's more to this issue than meets the eye. So I'm gonna wrap up here, but the work we're doing in states that have legalized, obviously we're trying to fight for regulations. You know, I'll tell you the pot czar in my state of Colorado, the guy who writes the rules for the marijuana industry, had to sell his pot company in order to take that position in the governor's administration. So, I mean, it's just a crazy state of affairs right now. Um, you know, that literally is the equivalent to asking the Marlboro man to uh, run the FDA, um, which I think we all know would be a really bad idea. Uh, so uh, that's something that we're watching. We're trying to you know, preserve the integrity of these regulatory bodies, do awareness campaigns, educate folks, um, stop drug driving. So those are things we're doing in states that have legalized. Um, states like yours that have not legalized marijuana uh, recreationally, look, we're fighting to do, you know, sensible reforms to expand uh, research, um, you know, to not, uh, you know, saddle kids with criminal records if they've got a joint in their pocket. We think they should be given another chance. Um, and look, trying to educate people and, of course, push back on this, uh, on the, the commercialization and legalization of marijuana. So our overall objectives really are we want to minimize drug use. We don't think it's a good idea to have more people using marijuana. Um, and we, but we also want to save societal resources. So we want to do this in a smart way. Um, we're not out to spread reefer madness. We're really here to spread sensible, smart policies that you know, reject this commercial, commercialization model, uh, but don't necessarily continue um, you know, some of these criminalization uh, things that we've done either. So we have a, a regular, a yearly report that we put out um, that I strongly, uh, strongly encourage you to check out on our website, learnaboutsam.org. Um, it's called The Lessons Learned from Marijuana Legalization. We look at all the states, um, you'll see a whole bunch of information, uh, including what I shared today, but a whole lot more on basically every topic that you can find. Um, it's free of charge. You can download it. I strongly recommend it. And finally, I'll just say my reason for being here, uh, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, the reason why I've been involved with Sam and fighting this fight for the last three years uh, is because, like I said, I have been a parent. Um, I've been raising my child in Denver, Colorado. And one day when she was just under the age of one, I want to say she was like eight or nine months old, uh, we took her for a walk in her stroller. Uh, down the sidewalk in a very nice area of Denver. We lived in Stapleton, Northeast Denver. Um, my wife and I were walking my daughter. She's in her stroller. She's asleep. Um, beautiful evening. And we're walking down the sidewalk. And as we're walking, she just gets buried in a cloud of secondhand marijuana smoke. Um, and we're quietly walking, kind of acknowledging to ourselves that she's breathing in this smoke as she sleeps. And there's, there's nothing we as parents can do about that. Um, and my wife turns to me and she goes, you know, that happens just about every single time we go for a walk here. 
And I turned to her and I said, you're absolutely right. Uh, that is so not normal. Um, and that was really the impetus for us to say, we don't want this to become the normal in this country. Um, we have enough issues with tobacco smoke and other issues as it is vaping now. Um, we don't wanna see more families and more parents and more kids having to face these challenges, not just in Colorado, but across the world. So um, that's what really uh, led me to do this and, and take that fight to DC. Um, I encourage you to check out this book, Read for Sanity. That's um, my boss, Dr. Kevin Sabet's um, seminal uh, uh, written work uh, that I encourage you to check out and kind of more about what we're doing. Our website and email here. I'm happy to take questions now. And um, thank you for your time and for sticking around to listen to this conversation. And thank you, Luke, uh, all the work that you've been doing and the investment here even now to help us here in, in Pennsylvania. So uh, we will uh, look to go to questions. One thing before, uh, we had some com questions submitted to us, and I'd like to cover a couple of those. But in the meantime, everyone that's online, uh, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom if you'd like to submit a question. We'll try to get to a variety of questions uh, now. And uh, so as you do uh, submitting questions, there was a couple I wanted to get to. So uh, Luke, one that we had uh, several questions come in were, and I'll phrase it as, as Carolyn from uh, West Milton said, uh, the quote, the perceived revenue stream for state government versus social costs. So you, you brought up the former Governor Hickenlooper, you know, don't do this for the revenue. And, and I guess, can you expound on that? We have legislators here that are pointing at, you know, millions of dollars to be given to Pennsylvania if we do this. How do you point out the, the social costs or just expounding upon yeah. that? If you will. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great, a great question. Yeah. I mean, again, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that go out and try to, you know, coming from a business background, again, having started two companies, I'll tell you, in the startup community, I mean, everybody's walking around saying, you know, uh, invest in my company, we're going to make $100 million within five years, if you just invest, you know, $100,000 in my business, or, or whatever it is. Um, everybody's kind of got that you know, uh, well, I guess I would call it like snake oil salesman. Um, look, we're going to, you know, this product's going to make you millions. And of course it rarely does because it's very hard to, to do that. Um, I think politicians really uh, are really good at making great grand promises and believing what, you know, some people try to tell them, uh, particularly advocates for marijuana legalization are really good at saying, you know, we're going to make all this money from this. But you know, at the end of the day, uh, until these states legalize, so in some ways it's almost good that my state of Colorado legalized marijuana so we could at least see some of the facts on what people are actually making. But how can you argue with the fact that only 0.78% of Colorado's state budget is made up by marijuana tax revenue? I mean, that is astonishing. Um, and every time I show this slide and, and people will go and they'll check me on it, they'll go to the state budget numbers and I encourage you to do that. You will, you will find that percentage. Um, but they go to this and they're just astonished because that is not what they hear. I mean, they hear that in Michigan, for example, they were told we're going to completely repave all of the roads in Michigan with marijuana tax revenue. Uh, but then the news stations did the math and realized that the, the even the rosiest projections in Michigan for their tax revenue would have only um, built about 100 miles of road <laughs> in such a massive state. Um, it, it's so unfortunate. So we have to see through the smokescreen of the grand promises and grandstanding made by this industry and its advocates. And we have to just look at the facts. Um, the other thing is, Again, cost reports. Um, we um, helped with a cost study in Colorado that, again, you can find on our website. We have a couple of other cost studies we did that really spell out the costs as we could find them. Um, it's not going to be as good, certainly not as good as if the, the state government would help us with that. Uh, but of course, you know, they're not terribly interested in doing that right now. Uh, hopefully they will one day. Uh, but you look at these costs, you know, drug driving fatalities. Um, federally, we know the numbers are that the cost of one life being lost is in the millions of dollars um, on the road when you factor in emergency services, etc. Um, you look at non-fatal injuries and going to the hospital, that's very expensive, lots of money involved in that, ER visits. Um, homelessness extremely, you know, goes you know, way up. Denver has been really struggling to deal with our homelessness issue. Um, and I can actually tell you that from firsthand because my mom is actually the director of Colorado, uh, dental director for Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, the biggest homeless services um, organization in Denver. Um, so we're seeing it firsthand, you know, she is. Um, and you look at absenteeism in the workplace and some other things, those costs all uh, add up. And then you start to look at the revenue projections and you think to yourself, wow, is this really, this really worth it? So I really wish, you know, going into these things that states would say, look, if we're gonna consider this, we want a full accounting of what the costs are of legalization. And then we wanna compare that to a full accounting of what the actual revenue is that has been brought in. Because um, in Colorado, 
they thought it was going to bring in a billion dollars in a year. Uh, but instead, they brought in $200 million. And it's been about $200 million a year, pretty much even uh, over you know, the entire lifetime of legalization. So what you'll hear from people is, oh, and there was some, there was some media on this, they said, oh, you know, Colorado made a billion dollars off the marijuana tax revenue. That was a big story last year. But nobody talked about the fact that that was six or seven years total um, after legalization, which means that again, it was uh, just under $200 million a year. So um, we have to really look at the numbers and make sure we're being very skeptical because people will make a lot of promises, uh, but it really has not added up when it comes to, to the costs mm -hmm. and the revenues. Great question. And before another question, I'll just highlight, you know, we'll look to follow up with those on the call uh, with an email, some of the resources, the cost studies. We'll try to provide some information to you. Or if you're, if you're listening to this afterwards, you can certainly contact both, you know, Smart Approaches to Marijuana or Pennsylvania Family Council, and we'll try to do our best to provide you with resources. Um, but another question that was submitted, Luke, is uh, regarding, you know, you, were, you started up some companies. So even as a, as a business owner, you know, the, the aspect of being an employer, yeah. you know, how... Are, is there data? You, you brought up Quest Diagnostics, um, but as an employer, whether it's workplace safety or even uh, changes to insurance, you know, if, if the state yeah. legalizes that, what would you say, you know, to an employer, what's been the impact you've seen in other states? Yeah, so I will tell you, it's been very tricky getting all the data we would like to get out of the employer side of the equation. Um, what we do get is, obviously, I had the positivity rates, which we have really good data on that from Quest Diagnostics, um, and that's very concerning. We do have some information on you know, car insurance going way up for individuals um, you know, because of legalization in states. It's actually twice what it was before legalization here in Colorado, so that's really gone up. Uh, but when it comes to accidents and absenteeism and other things in the workplace, those numbers have been tricky to get because companies have to be willing to provide that data, um, you know, provide, uh, you know, sometimes legal information, you know, on, uh, you know, absenteeism or other workplace issues. So that's something we're right now trying to work with companies on getting so that we can get a, an idea of what those numbers are looking like. Um, we are hearing, of course, anecdotally that this is a problem. Like you heard from GE Johnson, the biggest construction employer, they're saying, you know, we can't hire anybody. Um, so we're hearing anecdotes like that. Uh, but we're not getting the data. So that's something that, you know, we're trying to work with the business community to get that information because we think it'll be helpful. Um, but certainly what we've seen, you know, I, I had that study that I, I showed, um, it was a little far back, but I had that study that I had showed um, that was from 1990, very old, uh, but still relevant to today that looked at, you know, marijuana users that were regularly using it and what their issues were with absenteeism and other things. And obviously it found huge increases in that. Um, but those things need to be updated and I think those studies will come, uh, but it's gonna take a lot more time, which is really why the key message here is that we should not be rushing into this decision. Um, you know, we have nothing to lose as a society by saying, you know, let's give it 10 or 20 years and then look at what's going on in Colorado and make a decision. Um, you know, the only people who lose in that scenario are the industry and how, you know, and their profits. Uh, but for the public, we really don't lose anything by waiting. Yeah, thanks, Luke. And, and so I guess uh, turning, there was a, a few questions submitted. Um, you know, one I see from, from uh, uh, David, uh, he said, I heard that the black market pot in California is cheaper than legal pot because of high taxes. Is that true? So maybe just Again, what, you know, if, if people look to legalize this to end the black market, I know you mentioned about it, you yeah. know, getting rid of the black market in the yep. presentation, but maybe just... Yeah, the tax issue well. is, yeah, so that's a great question because I always, you know, and this is kind of the, the, the yin and the yang of any kind of drug tax or legalization situation is you have uh, the, you know, okay, if we're going to legalize it, oh, well, we better tax it. We better make money on it, right? So you have the question of, how, you know, how high or how low can the taxes be to then reduce uh, the black market? Because you have sky high taxes, obviously the black market's gonna you know, go up. They're always gonna beat that price. But the problem is whatever tax you put in there, it's always gonna be more expensive than what the black market's products are gonna be. Because the black market will never have taxes. The black market will never have to comply with you know, OSHA standards and other kinds of you know, regulatory frameworks that they've gotta deal with that, that the legal side would have to deal with. So the black market will always be cheaper will always be easier. Um, this plant is far too easy to grow, um, so they'll always have a supply. Um, so that's kind of the issue. So yes, in California, black market weed is way cheaper um, than legal weed. And so that's been used as an argument of the industry to say, look, the only reason the black market is here is because the taxes are so high. Um, so let's just lower the taxes. Well, of course, they want to lower the taxes because they don't want to pay as much uh, in taxes. They want more profits. But what they're not saying is whatever that tax rate is going to be, because obviously people are not going to go for, you know, a 0.001% tax on weed because that would be pennies 
um, compared to the pennies they're already getting. So, you know, whatever they set as a realistic number for that tax, 5, 10, 20%, um, that's going to be way more uh, than what the black market is going to be selling weed for. So you're pretty much in a catch-22, which is why full legalization of marijuana is a failed policy. We are seeing that this policy is a failure. You know, has the sky fallen and am I warming my hands by a dumpster fire here in Denver? No, you know, of course not. It's a beautiful state. I highly recommend everyone come to it. It's a wonderful place to live. Uh, but the, but that's not the point. It's not the point of did the apocalypse happen? The point is, is this policy working or not? Um, and it's not working. And that is one foundational principle, that tax issue of why it cannot work. I think you brought up a good point, even pointing to Colorado, you know, California somewhat is recent in their legalization and seeing black market increase, you know, Colorado's the same way. And what is it, five years, six years yeah. in legalization? Yeah. So, uh, another question that I, I found uh, poignant, especially for parents and teachers, uh, one that came in, Jen from Ronx, she asked the question, and I'll quote it, uh, what would you advise uh, to teens who are using it recreationally where it's in a state that's illegal. So say, you know, parents that are dealing with it, you know, possibly here in our state, yet they reference the states that are legalizing, be, uh, believing that it will soon be in their state as their reasoning. Or another question came up, you know, many teams view it without risk. Right. You know, I guess, what would you advise to parents and teachers yeah. that, you know, kids that don't see the risk, you know, what, what would you say to them? Yeah. Yeah, well, first of all, you're not going to convince teens that marijuana is harmful and, you know, because the, the message that they've heard in all of their favorite uh, mediums, whether it's music or social media, et cetera, the message they're, they're hearing is that it's harmless and it's great for you and, you know, it's, it's you know, not as harmful as alcohol, so, you know, why don't you just do it? You're not going to convince them. Um, maybe with the vaping crisis, I think vaping is an interesting um, inroad with youth and younger generations. Um, that's an area where I think the youth are becoming more aware of the harms. And so I think the vaping angle is a good angle to talk about and say, look, you know, look at these vaping illnesses, look at these cases. I don't want you to get hurt, you know, by, by this. But I, I think, you know, the, the way to go is not to try to convince them it's harmful. I think the way to go is to say, look, um, yes, some states have legalized it. Most states have not. Our state has not. Um, you know, but regardless of all that, do you really want to buy into the marketing pitch of a massive corporate juggernaut? Do you want to listen to Big Tobacco to tell you what's cool? Um, you know, do you want to be um, getting addicted, you know, accidentally addicted? Maybe you don't even realize you can be addicted. Do you want to get addicted to something that is being designed to basically steal your money and steal your life and, and basically own your brain for life? I think those are the things you have to talk about and show them what this industry is doing. I mean, nobody in the younger generation, I mean, I'm a millennial. I don't want to hear about uh, an industry that's targeting uh, poor people in their communities to try to screw them over and get money out of them. I mean, it's ridiculous. And so I think, you know, talking about some of those facts of like, look what this has created. Um, let's just set aside if you think marijuana is harmful or not. Um, look at what this industry is doing and look who's running it. I mean, do you like the people that are running these, these companies? Um, the, I think that's a, a more interesting way of going about it. And, and obviously talking about what's happened with Juul too, but it is a tough, uh, a tough issue. And I, 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 being a parent myself, I'm with you parents on, on the call that have uh, youth that are, are dealing with this, but I could just encourage you to say that um, I do think that over time, the truth will really come out on this and you just got to be patient and, and, and stay strong. Yeah, Lou, and in follow-up to that, you know, I, I know you shared earlier in the presentation, you know, someone that came from Ohio to Colorado and, you know, ended up in the hospital. Yeah. And, and it, if I recall right, it was buying a legal, kind of legal, so being able to share those stories. And I think you, either on your website or even just sharing now, you know, even to be able to share stories of, look what happened to this teenager. Um, you yeah. know, would you have any more stories or what, what would you point to? I mean, yeah, there are so many stories that one could talk about. I mean, um, just personally, stories that I know. I mean, there was a young couple that just got married uh, two years ago, and the husband decided to try out marijuana since it was legal, uh, which, by the way, everybody is, comes to the state and says, oh, it's legal. I'll try it. You know, so everyone wants to try it. Um, and he got addicted to it. Um, got very addicted to marijuana, and about a year later, um, he was so addicted that she had to leave him because he he had left his job. He you know wasn't able to kind of get things going uh, you know professionally and personally um, in their marriage, and it was a really hard thing to watch to see um, close friends of my family um, their marriage completely fall apart before our eyes. And and that's just one story. I mean, we have um, you know another good friend of mine and somebody who's a friend of Sam, a Kareen Gasper. Um, her daughter was I think 16 or 18 years old. 
beautiful, wonderful young lady who was working um, uh, in a nonprofit, doing things to, to make the world better. She was driving down the road one evening in a 35, I think the 35 or 45 mile an hour zone. This guy was going 85 miles an hour high on marijuana, crashed into her car and killed her. And now, um, you know, I, I'm friends with her on Facebook and, and we talk a lot, but every year when I'm celebrating my daughter, who's now three, I celebrate her birthday. Um, and I just, I, I talk to, you know, um, to Corrine, I can just see the pain in her eyes of how hard it is even to see, you know, she's happy for me, of course, but she, I can tell she's reminded of the, the daughter whose life she lost. Um, because of these attitudes on legalization. So um, it's tough. It, there are a lot of stories. I, I, could, I could bore you for hours with the stories that we hear. And we have people email us all the time with their stories. Um, you know, there are a lot of people impacted and that number is growing. Um, and I think those voices will continue to grow. Um, and they're going to have to grow because uh, unfortunately, it's very hard to drown out a multi-billion dollar marketing effort, um, which is what we're seeing with legalization right now. Again, thanks, Luke. And I know we'll go through a, a few more questions, um, if, if we may. Um, and yeah, one please. was regarding the advertising of marijuana. So in legalized states, you know, you, you brought up in the presentation how you went into a backpacking company and they had it right there. I guess even one, like, is that legal in Colorado? Obviously, you have companies that can do whatever they want and maybe, you know, not get caught or things like that. But I guess address that, the legality of it, but then also just the advertising, like big tobacco, are they, yep. you know, are there billboards? Are there, you know, what, what does advertising look like? Yeah, yeah. So that was, I, you know, the, the area of the law on that was gray, but I believe that was illegal. I did report it to the police, um, you know, because I just, yeah, I don't think anybody should be able to give out drug samples at a, any store. Um, but but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think technically that was illegal. And that just goes to show you kind of that this industry is basically just getting away with everything. I mean, they're they're doing that. Um, you know, the advertising is, is massive. Um, so you have billboards, you have um, radio ads, you have um, TV ads even sometimes. It's just, it's crazy what we're seeing. Um, and a lot of these advertisements are clearly designed for youth. Um, great example, uh, there was a pot shop last year that did a social media advertisement with Cookie Monster and said, come get, you know, pot cookies, 50% uh, off. And it's just crazy. I mean, and, and that's not the only time that they've used a Sesame Street character to advertise either. There was a couple other pot shops in Colorado that used uh, Big Bird and some other Sesame Street characters to uh, promote their products. So again, it's obvious kind of the, the angle they're going at because, you know, really the adult population is, yes, they want adults to use marijuana, but what they're really looking for is the youth because A, that you know, solidifies and guarantees future profits. But B, they know if they get youth to use these drugs, that they're going to get addicted uh, much more easily than even an adult mind would. And, and that's the problem is they'll know they'll get addicted and then they'll stay addicted throughout their lifetime. So that's where we're really going to start to see those impacts of legalization over the 10, 20, 30, 40 year mark when we see this next generation come up. I just hope we don't have to lose too many generations um, before we really learn the lesson. Um, I think that's the concern. But, you know, the marketing is all a key part of that, you know, how they market it. Um, they're doing it everywhere, especially on the radio. You keep hearing, you know, make a million dollars, become a marijuana investor. I mean, they're trying to get money from everybody they can. And there's all these lawsuits and all these issues because, of course, you know, most of it's a scam. Um, so there's just a lot of issues on, on that front. Well, Luke, uh, this is Michael Gear. I, I have a question for you or I just want to reflect a little bit. Uh, near the opening of your presentation, you talked about uh, Smart Approaches to Marijuana, the organization that you represent as ultimately being a public health oriented organizations. You're concerned about public health. And that struck a chord with me because right here in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis, it's really the public health officials are driving what's going on in our country. We're shutting down businesses, we're shutting down schools, we're right. doing social distancing, all out of the concern of the health of every individual in our commonwealth and in our country. And yet we have politicians, the same ones that are so willing to shut down our economy and put people out of business ultimately and, and so many negative impacts, understandably out of concern for public health. And I just wondered if you could comment on that about the, the notion yeah. that, that lobbyists are out there pushing for marijuana and, and you talk about that. Just comment on that because I, yeah. I found that very poignant and noteworthy about public health. It is very noteworthy and I think that's a great question. Um, I will start off by saying that if you all really like uh, and agree with what you're hearing from our public health experts that are making these recommendations on COVID and if you think these people are very credible, 
um, then you should find everything I've talked about today very credible because a lot of it came from them. <laughs> um, so uh, the people at the National Institutes for Health um, that are guiding the research right now on the potential um, you know, cure for uh, COVID-19 and um, a number of the other aspects of the policies being made right now are all people that we work with. Um, that Dr. Nora Volkow, who I showed that article from at the beginning, um, she is a huge part of this and she is the first person to come out and say the potency of marijuana is dangerous, it's addictive. She's got a number of research she's put out um, on that topic. Obviously, NIDA, um, part of the federal government, um, has put out a lot of information on the harms of marijuana. Um, so you, these experts that we see as credible today, helping us through a horrific storm that our country is going through in public health, um, are public health experts outside of just this crisis. And they're warning us about marijuana. So yes, I, I think it's very interesting. I will say that you know you 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 take this crisis aside and you look at our our politicians. Um, you know they're going to be listening a lot to uh, the you know the people that are very well funded, the lobbyists that are putting those messages out to them every day. Um, but we have to make the voice of these public health experts and the voice of science be louder than that. Um, and I think this crisis, you know, as tragic as it is, and it's hard for everybody, I know. Um, you know, but I think this crisis will give us pause to step back and say, okay, um, let's rethink how we um, see our society, how things are going to work when we return back to normal. Um, and do we want to play with fire with another potential uh, public health crisis? Because I'll tell you, we already had one with the vaping crisis. The marijuana vaping crisis was our first national public health crisis related to marijuana. Um, and I don't want us to have other crises uh, like it. So it's things to think about for sure. Great question. Thanks. Well, Luke, thank you so much. And, and if I may, I had one more question. Please, uh, yeah. Because it was really probably the most question that I received. A few people on, online here, many ahead of time. There was Susan from Bethel Park, Gail from Elizabethtown, Beth from Wexford. I could, what can citizens do? What are some action items that people can take to stop recreational marijuana here in Pennsylvania? Great question. Yeah, so I would encourage you. I mean, first of all, Pennsylvania Family Institute has some great work they're doing locally um, in, in Pennsylvania to um, advocate against legalization in your state. So I obviously encourage you to check out their um, website and information. Um, we also on our website, learnaboutsam.org, have a whole bunch of advocacy tools. So we have a toolkit um, that you can find right off the menu that has literally facts and one pagers and documents on every aspect of this issue you can think of from driving to youth to um, you know, the state's rights argument to all, every kind of argument you can find, we have stuff on it, lots of facts and research. Um, and what you can do is you can A, sign up for email lists. We have a whole lot of tools to allow you to email all of your legislators, state and federal, um, that you can do right off the website. So I encourage you to do that. Um, but we're always looking to get involved in every state um, and do different things, uh, you know, depending on where the need is. So we've done work with Pennsylvania Family Institute and other groups in Pennsylvania. Um, so I encourage you just to stay on our email lists um, and keep an eye out because we always have different things going on that you can be a part of. But really the biggest thing is making sure your voice is heard. So sending emails, calling and sending letters to your legislators, um, again, both state and federal, everybody needs to hear this perspective, right? We're not out here trying to say, let's, you know, let's keep locking everybody up in prison and, you know, marijuana is the devil's lettuce and blah, blah, blah. We're not out to say that, right? They need to hear this message that we don't want Big Tobacco 2.0 in our state. We don't want another big addiction giant like what the opioid manufacturers have done to our state. We don't want that again, because we have to force these politicians to see the connection there. And I've, I've talked to a lot of them. We've, you know, our organization, and I'm sure Pennsylvania Family Institute um, has as well. A lot of these legislators on both sides of the aisle do not like the idea of legalizing marijuana at all. Um, but what they're hearing is that it's the new thing, it's popular, we got to get out of the way. On the Democratic side, they're getting social justice, and if they don't, if they're not in support of it, they're not in support of social justice. On the Republican side, they're hearing this is a liberty issue, how can you take away uh, people's right to choose what they want to do for themselves? So we have to cut through that noise and say, this is what it's really about. Look at the facts, look at the science. Um, we do not want this in our state. So that's the message that needs to get out there. And whether you're writing an op-ed, a letter to the editor, or sending a letter to your, your legislator, or calling them, or whatever it is, all of that stuff needs to happen. Um, and we certainly need you to be present um, at our events and other things that we do. And of course, you know, for those who have the ability to give, now is not a great time because you need that money. But uh, when, when better times come to this country, please give to organizations as well to be able to, to fight that. Well, thank you, Luke. Thank you so much for serving us well. And, and, and truly, I, I appreciate you seeing all the news stories of you and what you're doing across the nation. 
Just You're thank you for that. You. And it's an uh, honor to be here, and, and I appreciate the work you all are doing. And I know there are a lot of um, people doing really important work on this Zoom call as well. And I appreciate your time today to listen to this conversation. And um, very much, I'm glad to hear that you're all safe and able to be on this call. So thank you. All right. Thank you. And for everyone, a few more resources, just again, to, to highlight uh, the websites, learnaboutsam.org, uh, also with pafamily.org, with Pennsylvania Family Council. Uh, you can look at pafamily.org slash marijuana for some resources. Also some emails. Uh, we'll certainly look to follow up with everybody on this call, but you're, you're welcome to email. Uh, you'll see on the screen or those by phone, uh, dbart uh, at pafamily.org. It's D, D as in boy, A-R-T as in Tom at pafamily.org or luke at learnaboutsam.org. Uh, that uh, you can certainly follow up with us. If there were questions that we didn't get to, certainly there were many, uh, you know, asking, but I think Luke, you did a great job covering a lot of, of ground. And uh, we will certainly look to point, I'll plug some of those one pagers that, that Sam has. They recently updated ones on the youth use, uh, how that impacts, uh, looking at Colorado specifics, just recently updated those. But there's a, there's a slew of resources and I appreciate how they have a scientific uh, policy department, you know, scientists from Harvard and, you know, these, these credible resources that, that they can point to, uh, to provide these resources to us to use. So whether you're writing a letter to the editor, you're talking with your state senator, your state representative, talking with your neighbors, you know, thank you for doing your part to really spread the awareness of this issue. And, and we're going to need your help in this. So connect with us and, and we'd love to help in your efforts on this issue. So uh, with that, I guess I'd I, uh, look to, to Michael if you had any closing comments, and uh, we'll we'll close this out. So you need to be un unmuted there, Michael. There we go. Uh, first, want to thank uh, thank Luke uh, for that presentation, as Dan just did. A tremendous resource, and we uh, appreciate it so very much, and appreciate the opportunity to present this to folks across Pennsylvania. I'm sure there are many people who participated in today's. A webinar uh, and watching uh, who think, well, I know some other people that should watch this. So we're going to have a link available should all the tech uh, side of this all work out. Uh, this was recorded and we should make that available and we would encourage you to share it with other folks and uh, share these resources as well and encourage people to get involved and make a difference. Uh, this is a challenging issue and as we started off the call today, our Lieutenant Governor is thinking that the COVID-19 crisis is a great opportunity to force legalization and commercialization of marijuana on Pennsylvania. And it's gonna take citizens like you all across our Commonwealth to resist that and to protect our Commonwealth, the, the public health and uh, the well-being of children and families in our Commonwealth and our businesses as well. And so we appreciate again, Luke participating, appreciate the Pennsylvania Family Institute team, Dan Bartkoyak, Luke, uh, 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 Kurt Weaver, who's on with us as well and the whole team that helped put this uh, together as well. Watch our website and our emails for uh, further information, not only on this issue, but on the many issues that we work with at Pennsylvania Family Institute and Pennsylvania Family Council, and for upcoming live at lunch events like this one, and perhaps some Zoom, Zoom uh, webinars and events that we'll do at other times uh, during the calendar day and uh, throughout the weeks. Uh, please stay safe, everyone, a happy Easter. Uh, to all those who are watching, and uh, God bless you, and thank you very much. Dan, anything further to say? And said, happy Easter to all, and thank, yeah. thanks again, Luke. God bless you all, and thank you for having me. Have a great day. Be safe. Thank you.